Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 243. That's dos cuatro tres. How you doing? How you feeling, my friends? Good. How am I? Amazing, actually. Thank you for asking. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fresh. Everything is where it should be. I'm hoping, right? So far, where my body and all that stuff is malarkey. But yeah, I'm feeling good, man. Feeling good. How are you guys doing? You doing great? Cool. It's Thursday, the 31st of October, somewhere, wherever you are. And this happens to coincide with Halloween. <laughs> Scary, spooky times. Uh, big up everyone that's celebrating Halloween and getting dressed up. I don't know how you guys do it. If you're over the age of 25, I just don't get it. I think maybe that maybe if you're over the age of 25 and you're a dude or a girl and you're single, it might be a good time to kind of get dressed up because, you know, that's when all the freaks come out or the freaky side of us comes out. There's probably some sort of... um anthropological historical um ancestral explanation for why people get a bit more frisky when they put on a bit of makeup um and pretend to be other people right um maybe it goes back to those kind of eyes wide shut parties you know when they you know um that people put on this little face mask and do these little weird rituals and have these weird orgies in place like that so maybe it's something to do with that but i don't know why it is but i i don't think i've ever been to a halloween party where i haven't seen people getting off with each other everywhere right it's just a standard practice in it so maybe that's why people still go but i don't know about you guys but i can't even bother to go to events that i book right i i booked tickets to go see a jordan peterson uh film the other day on wednesday actually and it seemed like you know i think it's called the life of jordan peterson or something like that. so it's a new it's a new documentary that's come out that expect, it, it basically gives a fair and balanced point of view of you know jordan peterson's rise and some of these hardships he's kind of gone through the last few years and it's a real cool film to go watch right i would have gone to Covent garden to go watch it i would have been around people that I don't know. Um, I would have been in a company of people who share similar interests as mine. I would have been able to network. I would have been able just to kind of meet, you know, like-minded people. It would have been a great evening. I didn't go because I just couldn't be bothered, right? I went training in the morning. I I had, I had to do a bit of reading. I went to record a little mix. I, I went to put together. I just didn't want to leave my house. So imagine not going to a Jordan Peterson film event, right? That's going to be very it's very um, beneficial to my life in some way, shape, or form. It's definitely going to be worth the ticket that I paid for it. Imagine going to that. Imagine me not going to that because I just can't be bothered. And then imagine me having the the requisite uh, desire or the ability to sit there, stay at my house, get out face. And I'm, I'm actually one of the lucky people. I'm actually one of the only people in the world that happens to have face paint just lying around my house. And that's because I, I worked in my... Hold on. Yeah, a couple, a few jobs away. A few jobs ago, maybe like, let's say five jobs ago, I used to work for this really big art materials manufacturer and they were producing uh, like when I was there it happened to coincide when it was you know launching their new Halloween collection and I happened to like nick a few a, uh, nick a few cases of it and essentially just like you know face paint um, and also some stencils that you can use and some good brushes so usually it's quite you know you don't usually have that stuff lying around you have to go out and buy it but I guess like most people like Christmas decorations right you just reuse it every year so I'm actually quite fortunate I have face paint here I have a, a few materials I could probably use to make an outfit, but come on, man. A grown up like me going out, you know, and deciding to play fancy dress to go out and what and party in a pub and fancy dress. I always thought, in my opinion, anyway, Halloween especially, it only it's only fun for the first couple of hours, isn't it? Or maybe the first three hours, and after that, it just you just forget you even got your thing on, really. Unless you're one of those absolute wrongins that is always like look at me look at me look at someone got on, right the whole night your whole identity is fucking defined by what you're wearing that gets a bit annoying but for the most part the whole halloween thing wears off very quickly right doesn't it i think so in my opinion it wears off very very quickly but maybe it's just me um but yeah i'm not doing halloween this year that's not that's not an option um i just you know I'm, I'm too grown up for that shit i'm too grown up i don't care for like going out there and seeing girls scantily clad not interested I think when you're that, when you're probably as, maybe I have to be more of a horny dude to be out there, right? Just like fucking boner in hand, looking at girls in short skirts, thinking, oh, this is awesome. But I just don't care enough for that. And I don't care enough to be surrounded by dudes that all have there. Because, for instance, the, the, the lowest common denominator for all dudes is going to be, you know, putting on a onesie, some sort of like onesie outfit that's just going to be a, a good cheat code. Or painting your face, right? And I'm not going to do either of those things. So, um, yeah, I think personally as the years have progressed i've probably come to the realization that maybe those holidays are more for the opposite gender as opposed to us guys i think girls probably have more fun at halloween than boys do because i think you know by and by and large girls probably get have probably more range in the kind of outfits they can put on right i've seen some fucking amazing makeup um 
images of of people who have been especially the makeup artists on youtube who went fucking crazy with some of the halloween makeups it looks just insane the level of work and, and and kind of ingenuity that goes into it is just nuts um but again putting in contacts dyeing your hair bleaching your eyebrows all this sort of shit like come on just count me the fuck out of it i'm not, I'm not involved I'm not involved i just don't care enough for these kind of things i mean like just find it a little bit basic to be like celebrating certain days like, oh it's, it's, it's halloween oh i don't know just just a bit naff if it was me and i really want to celebrate halloween i probably would have celebrated it last weekend i think there was some halloween this is probably a weird halloween isn't it because if it fell on the thursday oh no actually maybe last year was probably different maybe it falls on a wednesday so effectively you can't really party party on a wednesday because you got work the next day and you can't really do it on the following weekend because it's gone in it. Like for the, it's, it's fucking the second of November by that time, right? So you kind of have to do it the week before, which is like you know six days before the fucking actual day of Halloween. It's fucking that's how that happens, isn't it? Uh, but I think most people probably celebrate it the weekend before in it, just to make it a little bit easier. But yeah, big up you Halloween people. I don't know how you do it. I'm not involved. I have no, little but no desire to get involved in those kind of things. But one thing I am involved in, one thing that I do care about is Sober October. And today happens to be the last day of Sober October. So everyone that's out there who's been on this journey, who's been abstaining from alcohol, abstaining from drugs, abstaining from any other vice you had in your life that you kind of wanted to get in, in control of or to have it, you know, have a sort of balance. Big up you, man. We did it. 31 days of sobriety. And now comes the epic uh, <laughs> uh, bender November, right? Which is, again, I mentioned, I think... The issue, I don't really, have, you know what, I think most Sober October participants, I have to speak for myself included, I think we're we're probably keenly aware that we're probably not, we're probably not addicts, but we're probably the, the level below an addict, I would say. I know, I don't give a tissue, I would say I am, probably the level below addict, because the reason why I say that, because usually, the day after Sober October, you just go fucking crazy, right, you go absolutely nuts, you just go and do the most. The most of all things, you just try and make up for all the lost time that, you know, for all the times you missed out on doing X, Y, and Z, you go out and just do it as exactly as the clock strikes 12, which can be a little bit, you know, a little bit worrying. But that's that's the only thing that kind of gets me a bit bummed out about Sober Toby. You spend the whole 31 days doing really, really good, and then you just go fucking crazy on the, on the last day, which was probably why, I think this is probably why most trainers... They don't really encourage people to do cheat meals, I would assume, in diets, right? You see a lot of trainers will say, no, don't have cheat meals. Just have, just go completely strict your diet, build up a good habit for the month. And then after the month is done, then start introducing cheat meals, right? Don't kind of relax because the, the theory probably is, is that if you have a cheat, cheat day scheduled in for the Saturday, it usually turns into a cheat day that turns into a cheat days, right? It turns into Saturday and Sunday. But now I think the more sensible approach is to probably have a cheat meal, right? To probably, you know, have a consistent diet, all the way throughout the week and maybe have for the i don't know for your last for your dinner on the saturday night or something if you want to have a burger and a beer you can right um let your hair down and then kind of get back on the saddle again on the sunday um that's probably the right idea behind those kind of things which i kind of get but yeah so i'm talking is good for the balance like i said i'm good for the balance i bought loads of books i've listened to loads of books um death save alcohol has been quite cool i've saved loads of money of course that's 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 the thing you notice straight away your bank account looks a lot different when you're not Consist consistently buying the odd beer or here, the old beer here and there, whiskey here and there. And for the most part, I think the most money I've spent has been kind of going to events, right? I went to Inferno at the yard the other day. That was really fun. I went to see Richie Horton play at Fall. That was really fun. And that's a, probably the most amount of money I've actually spent at an event. Most of my money or most of my time has been spent, how would you say? Has been spent just kind of enjoying what I have, in it? Like, I don't know, like, DJ more at home, recording mixes, um, reading some books, right? Um, taking my time and just walking home after work and, you know, uh, taking in my surroundings. It's not the most beautiful place to look around at, don't get me wrong, but, you know, just kind of centering yourself as opposed to rushing everywhere. I felt that a lot. And just generally, you know, it's good for your brain isn't it? to kind of be aware that you can stop at the, you can stop at the, you can stop like that instantly, cold turkey. You don't need to like, you know, go into any kind of rehab clinic uh, you don't need help or assistance um you're not sacrificing all your monies to kind of get back on that saddle yeah i don't know man i love it i love it i love it i love it um it's, it's been a good adventure really and again 
like I said, uh, I, weight wise, I'm pretty good. I didn't reach my goal of getting under 200 though. I got 219, which is you know, again, I think I probably could have been a bit more strict with my diet. I probably would have done the two nine, the two two hundred two ten probably. I would have done that in 30 days. Uh, but I got down to 219, so I'm finally under the 220, which I'm super happy about. So as you can see from the fucking camera, if you're watching via YouTube, the muscles are coming out. The face is looking a lot more skinnier. So that's a good look. And I'm just going to continue, really, actually. I'm probably going to have a little bit of a drink on a Friday and a Saturday. I'm DJing on Saturday, actually, at the Heathcote and Star for my night, Labatee. So if you're around there, definitely check that out. But for the... What was I going to say? But for the... Yeah, but I think for the majority of November, just keep it clean. Um, not no need to kind of get crazy or anything because I think I've got a couple of events I'm going to like the Innovision party and a few others uh, but there's no need to go crazy after anything else I think I'm just going to carry on the kind of good behavior until November too because why not you know why the hell not um, but yeah man it's been it's, it's been a good journey it's been a really good journey I've, I've read what I think I've finished about three I finished three physical books two audio books that's five books in total this month um, I've worked out basically every other day, so a minimum of five days a week, which is what I wanted to do. I've ran at least 10 miles a week, which is what I wanted to do too. Um, yeah, I've, I've done pretty much all I wanted to do. So if I've missed out really is the language learning and the journaling. I didn't get a chance to do, or I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't do really. Um, just because I find journaling quite hard. I mentioned it previously before, kind of, you know, sitting down and putting my thoughts on paper just makes me get a bit, um, you know, just get a bit, you get a bit freaked out um that's one thing and then what's the other thing journaling gets hard oh and the studying of, of spanish i don't know man it's just another hobby to kind of include an hour in it's a lot of work in it to kind of do but again i think i'm gonna the, the stuff that i didn't do no no i think the stuff that i didn't do this month for in october i'm definitely gonna do next month in november i'm gonna carry on and start doing that every single day just to kind of give myself a bit more of a routine going forward but yeah i don't have too many things planned for November, I have uh oh I have, actually I'm going to Trix curate. So Trix is playing an extended set, probably about four hours at Mixed Garage on the 23rd of November. That should be quite fun. So I'm probably gonna go to that, and that's about it really. I'm gonna just keep it, keep it tight, keep it keep it quiet, and just kind of kind of roll with the good feelings I had through so far through so October. But yeah, but so far so good, man. No crazy celebrations, no crazy party vibes. Just take it as it comes. And now I think going forward, I have a bit of a stronger practice in terms of, in terms of, just doing the alcohol thing on the weekends, especially on the Fridays and Saturdays, and kind of leaving the Sunday to recover, and then kind of going on, you know. So you're you're predominantly having a good week. I think that might be a good way to go about it. And again, not having alcohol at home obviously helps. And with that regard, um, obviously it'd probably be more advantageous to have like a bit more of a a better self-control right and have imagine because some people have bars and stuff in their house so i should be able to do that but i know me i know it's not going to work so i'd rather just not have alcohol at home and if it means i don't have alcohol at home you know how i say how lazy i am about getting out and putting on the fucking face paint it's unlikely i'm going to go out and buy a beer because just i can't bother ordering it on like an uber east or delivery is like you know 50 percent markup on the actual price so all those things kind of makes you hit a bit of a roadblock and you refuse to do it so i think going forward i'm just going to stick to that um no no alcohol at home keep it to the weekends um try and only go to like big events like this event i'm going to see tricks on the 23rd of november it's a big club night so then you're not kind of again expending a lot of money uh getting fucked up because you're actually going to go see a dj play and loads of that good stuff in between but yeah so far so far so good man if you have any experiences with your sober october any things that you want to share let me know in the comments that'll be much appreciated but yeah i've, I've had a good time so far i'm not sure how else has got on but yeah i feel good i feel good I feel good. All right, cool. Let's get some topics. Let's talk about what we have to talk about. Let's get on with it because, you know, that's the main thing we want to do right here, right now, right here, right now. Let's go through some stuff. What have I got here on the list of stuff I want to talk about? Let's go on my list of options. So um, I've got, I got some DJ stuff to talk about, some other running stuff, and maybe a couple of streetwear bits, and then we're going to round off the show. Uh, before we carry on, um, I've just I've just put together a new mix. 
uh, some electronic music, some electronic body music special. Um, if you're not familiar with the music, I recommend you check it out. Um, it's available now on SoundCloud. You can see it here on the screen. Check out my SoundCloud page. I'll put the link below in the show notes. Um, Handsome Black Man. I'm on there. It's called Text Mix, Text Test Mix Episode Number Thirty One, an EBM special. So I've got loads of nice, really cool EBM music there that you can go and listen to. So definitely recommend you check that out if you're that way inclined. Um, also on the docket here for myself, a bit of shameless for promotion. I've also got an event coming up on the Saturday, which I'm DJing at my night called Liberties, which is taking place at the Heathcote and Star that I usually play at most Saturdays and most weekends. So again, if you're in the area and you want to hear some of the way that I play, you want to hear some funk and disco, have a good vibe, have a little drink in a nice little pub, then come to my favorite spot, Heathcote and Star on the 2nd of November from 9 to 1 a.m. for my night called Liberties. Information is on the screen of the flyer, but again, I'll link in the show notes if you're listening via the podcast app. And that is me, basically. So let's get into some topics, because that's the main important thing we want to do here, to grab our nose first. I actually went, out, I actually went and got a new prescription of um, asthma pumps that are hopefully going to help with my allergies, because they've got a bit worse during the winter months, which is not really ideal, but... Oops, as you can see here, I've got a couple of asthma pumps. I've got, I've got two of these, actually. Uh, Salomon CF, CFC free inhalers. Um, I'm meant to use them twice, two puffs uh, to be inhaled up to four times a day. So that's what I kind of got to kind of relieve me of this. So if you're, if you're hearing me a bit stuff at the moment, you know, I've been running outside a lot. Um, I don't know, the allergies are getting me as they are, as they, as they usually do. But I'm going to try and use this inhaler, and that's probably going to offset some of those effects that i have with the allergies and stuff fingers crossed and if not what can you do i'm fucked up so let's get some topics here and then carry on so number one topic we have here we've got the berlin commission club tour which is a pretty cool article i saw here on resident advisor of pretty interesting news um the berlin club commission uh, to host the european club on the 30th anniversary of the fall of the wall which is a really interesting thing so the berlin club commission i think are the same commission that were instrumental in terms of you know maintaining and sustaining and kind of trying to help out some venues and trying to make sure they don't get knocked down and regeneration of some of the areas in Berlin doesn't kind of push some of the legendary clubs out of the area because Berlin, unlike other cities, recognizes the value these kind of nightlife spots kind of bring to their overall um, a global appeal, um, how they contribute to their overall GDPR. So they've kind of um, installed this Berlin Club Commission in order to kind of you know make sure things are kind of uh, protected and held in a certain place. And so far, you see we've reaped the rewards of it. Anyone who's been to Berlin will know just how amazing the nightlife is, how many options that you have, the scope of it. It covers the majority of the city. It covers every area of the city and it was one area, like maybe the spots in London do. Just really intelligent and um, fair and really um, forward-thinking way, way of kind of, you know, dealing with the problem with nightlife and weighing up the pros and the cons and making sure all voices are heard when it comes to the conversation of regeneration. So this Berlin Cup Commission World Tour, um, sorry, European Club Night on the 5th anniversary is a good idea because I think it's probably again in loads of different promoters from all around the world to kind of celebrate, you know, the you know basically the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is an amazing concept in and of itself, actually. Um, so it says here, um, collective from over 27 countries will come to Berlin to participate in the Awareness and Initiative on November 9th. So I'll say the following. I love that map actually with the like in terms of the European Union, which probably might be a little bit of an ode or a little bit of an acknowledgement of U U the UK leaving the European Union and maybe kind of really trying to re-emphasize, you know, what kind of benefit again that free that freedom of movement within the European Union has allowed a lot of promoters, I think, on these shores to go and venture out, to seek new influence, to seek new inspiration. And also it's allowed people within the European Union to kind of see what we're doing on, on our side, right? Because I think that's a that's the thing that I've liked a lot. I think London, I think we do a good thing of doing it really, but sometimes we do that kind of really uh, heavy handed kind of, you know, oh, Berlin like an egg, right? They've got a few of those in, in, in egg, egg, which I, I don't want to call them out because, you know, they're a good club and they kind of do the best they can. They stay open quite late as well for that area so you know they probably serve their local community but i know they have those kind of berlin club night kind of theme nights where, where they invite loads of berlin people to come and play or people that just happen to be german or people that might have lived in berlin a couple of months ago right but it's not it's hard to kind of take that vibe and transplant it and kind of and put it in london it's not that easy but i think what berlin do quite well or what a lot of european union cities do quite well when they hear somebody's blowing up in the UK, they'll just ask you to come across, right, and play what you play in the UK there. They want a bit of your kind of culture, a bit of your musical taste, a bit of your history, 
and they want to kind of use it in that space that they're using. They don't want you to kind of uh, conform to what they play, which I've always thought is quite um, impressive in that regard. Um, so this is probably a good way of doing it, right? Imagine all the different promoters from 27 different countries coming together and kind of, you know, um, in, in general, kind of, you know, layering, sonically layering the tapestry of sound around this kind of building or this kind of club environment or open air. It might be a really, really good idea. So the outer is the following. Um, the goal of initiative, which takes place on November 9th, is to create awareness around the significance of a historic event. The quote says, Today we take for granted the ability as Europeans to travel and work and celebrate um, together freely, says a Facebook event. Yet across the globe, military conflicts continue whilst uh, repressed and marginalized groups are further limited by ingrained systems and Im immigration policies that stifle these communities' freedom of movement. The European Club Night gives the opportunity to come together. Next weekend, collectives from 27 different countries around across Europe, sorry, will come to Berlin to celebrate uh, the parties in 27 local clubs and promoters. Among them, Poland's uh, Jones of One crew will play Greece Müller. Lisbon's ZBD crew will play the Akud Macht New. And Belgium's Mik Kuzma crew will play at Arcado. Another aim of the European Club Night is to inspire and build a long-term partnership and maintain regular artistic exchange. To kick off the event, the Club Commission will present a club culture manifesto in which the participating clubs commit to common values charter. That is fucking cool, man. It, but it makes me really think, maybe I should get back into club promoting. Again, I mentioned it previously here. Like I've, I used to do that quite often in the heyday of the, you know, the strip and the Dawson scene and Shoreditch and stuff. But you know, over time, the clubs that I was doing it at one of one one or two, one by one, most of them closed. Some of them moved on from the stuff that I was doing and kind of seeked better representation of what they were trying to bring to the clubs. Maybe some of the bar managers were very cutthroat and kind of cut the OGs out and trying to introduce introduce more of a younger crowd because obviously bars and clubs only have a short shelf life in London. Uh, they need to be constantly reinventing themselves. So there was a lot of movement, a lot of upheaval. Then I moved across here to Stratford, which is, you know, way, way, way out of the kind of um, hip kind of, you know, culturally relevant bits of london like shoreditch and east london and dawson and stuff and maybe south london brixton peckham and all that stuff i'm not really near any of those places i don't really go out there on the weekends unless i'm going out to an event so you kind of lose touch of what's happening right and i'm not my, my feet aren't on the ground anymore or my ear isn't to the ground anymore so um but then uh, again in an effort to kind of build up my it was a kind of this is all on purpose i wanted to kind of be able to live in a place like this where i don't have to pay that much rent considering you know if i lived a bit further in inward to the center i'd have to pay a bit more but then obviously i'd have the advantage of being able to be right on top of everything and you know be able to know when a club's opening be familiar with people network and all the stuff that kind of allowed me to get a club night back in the day would have worked better if i lived inwards but also i wanted to kind of be able to kind of harness or kind of develop my djing skills right and i thought the best way to do it What's to go and play in front of people that don't really want to be there? Because I, in my experience, again, are you looking for my experience? I think I didn't grow that much as a DJ when I was in Dawson and Shoreditch. I maybe grew a lot as a promoter, understanding what it takes uh, as an event organizer, as just a person to network and stuff. I probably grow a lot in that short period of five, four year, four to five years. But I think as a DJ, I've kind of grown. But I've kind of grown more in the last two and a half playing in. Um, you know, local bars and pubs than I ever done back there because, like I mentioned, no one wants to see, no one wants me in these bars and pubs that I'm in there, right? No one's coming to see me play, so I'm having to kind of balance the kind of not disturbing the night and also kind of showing off my musical range and showing off my ability to DJ. So by and large, it's been quite successful. It's been quite good. I, you know, I get booked regularly to play, mostly every month to go play in bars and pubs. But there is that disconnect where I'm just not in the scene, right? So I can I can attend an event as a dj but i'm not really known as a promoter or as an organizer of parties which kind of doesn't help in terms of kind of further your ability to kind of dj in other places a bit, bit bigger nightclubs bigger festivals and i guess the only other way to do that is to just to do the conventional approach and just learn how to produce which is something that i might have to end up doing right if i'm not willing to put on a club night and to do that whole game again, especially nowadays where there's not as many options and spots to go to and they have to be... The club that I have to put on would be a lot more DIY than it was back in the day. 
a lot of the places that we use were quite ready made right you just go and plug and play sort of stuff but now you have to kind of seek out different spaces um, you might have to do a world unknown thing and gather a mailing list and email people out and sell tickets hand to hand uh install a sound system get your own security hire bar staff if you have to be a bit more in uh, in, in ingenious in ingenuitive whatever that word is called innovative whatever that word is um in your approach to kind of putting on an event um because obviously punters nowadays expect more unfortunately um you can't really you can't really expect a kid that goes to print works every other weekend to kind of you know just come up to your local night in a bar somewhere in dawson and have you know and think it's anything special especially if the djs aren't that great you need to have like a space to go to that's a bit out of the that's a bit far away maybe secret code words and shit um that really is going to help with everything but again if i don't willing to do that i just have to produce simple as that i produce make some good tunes put them out send them out to maybe uh send out demos and then hope like a big dj plays it and then through that kind of way someone recognizes your song it blows up and then you become the big dj person which again it's not easy either right both options are very um low probability of success but those are the only ways to kind of really kind of really um speed up the process of becoming like a uh res a kind of a full-time dj right essentially that that will speed up the approach of it because if you want to be a full-time dj and have that as your career you have to produce a song that someone knows or you have to be well known as a dj enough that people want to book you to play places which again is a the, probably the harder route to go down because you know it's just it's the one that everyone can do isn't it? it's the lowest form of entry isn't it um, everyone can dj but not everyone can produce and not everyone can put on an event so that's when it kind of you know everyone starts to fall off in those kind of two little strands of trying to those two little routes but yeah those are some things I'm, those are the things i'm thinking of at the moment mulling, mulling over decisions i have to make in the next couple of months maybe as well to kind of figure out why i want to take it especially with the next with the end of the year approaching i want to make sure every year i'm developing every year i'm evolving and i'm trying to really push myself in order to kind of make sure that i'm actually my potential in it i think i have a voice i think i have something to say i think i have an interesting approach i think it'd be quite cool to see someone like me at you know at a flipping you know oval space or somewhere or like an x or y behind the decks i think you know that'd be quite cool for the punters to see someone like me um i think i'll bring something different to the space um and also to the scene in general so i can only do myself justice by making sure that i'm pushing myself and making sure that i'm doing as much as i can to get to those kind of places fingers crossed but yeah um i recommend you check it out uh berlin cup commission 9th of november if you're in berlin um it's gonna start 9th of november oh yeah basically all all at the same time which is fucking sick it reminds me of that what's that festival they used to have in dawson where you used to go to different it's like a festival that was held in different clubs um that was really cool i think it was like a punk night thing i forgot what the, what the name of it was Different club nights will host different bands and you just play all the day, all the way through. I think it might just be all on the strip, so you have to jump from place to place to place. That was a pretty cool idea. But yeah, I recommend you check it out. Um, loads of interesting nights on there. Loads of really cool venues that are taking part. And again, just a good opportunity for you to kind of uh, celebrate um, the beauty that is nightlife, innit? Because there is nothing really that comes close to it, really, innit? No, I don't think they... I think some people are different. Some people would say they prefer open air parties to night to night like nightlife but i love nightlife man there's nothing i love more than getting ready the night of of, a, of an event uh you know uh, having some pre-drinks recording something or doing a little bit of a mix at home to get you in the mood and then going to the event nowadays i try to like not play music when i go to parties i just want to my my ears to kind of be cleansed so the whole journey i kind of have no headphones in and as soon as you get in it's like do 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 or when you're approaching you're walking down the street approaching the club you're about to go to it's just oh, there's nothing nothing really comes close to it man so yeah I recommend you check that out the berlin club commission um the european club night on the 30th anniversary of the fall of the berlin war 9th of november i'll put the link in the show notes if you want to check it out for yourself okay so moving on from the site what else do we have here on the list we have nina kravitz isn't allowed to wear braids according to the social media this is a weird one it's something that i'm happy that it seems that most people on the scene have kind of seen the story i've kind of like rolled their eyes at it which i'm happy about because of i think council culture and all the wokeness stuff that was happening nowadays with social justice warriors just people in general activism activists and stuff it's interesting if you look at it for if you kind of zoom out and look at look at who it's affecting it only affects certain groups of people it doesn't seem to really affect people in the hip-hop industry you don't really get it a lot in the uk rap industry you don't really get it a lot in the black twitter world um you don't really get it a lot in the des- no design world you have got a few people that have been booed out for saying crazy shit fashion not so much and also electronic music i think they've tried a few times to kind of do this kind of to kind of pull up people on weird things and so far so so far the only person that's really got it vakula obviously with his comments 
um, towards the big group of female DJs that kind of stopped some of his bookings. Um, the other dude, I forgot his name, who had a real big trouble and they kind of cancelled his panel discussion talk and people were protesting him and him doing the ADE, DF, ADE guy, I forgot his name, from last year, Keesling, is it Keebling, Keesling? One of those kind of dudes. But so far, no one's really been cancelled in, in electronic music, even fucking um, Jackmaster, right? He did what he did a few a few a couple of years ago was it last last year at the festival and he didn't really get cancelled right he's now in basically it looks like he's kind of moved to Ibiza or he's moved to Europe and since he's just playing gigs in Europe he's not coming to I don't think he's come to the UK yet since that happened already so he seems really happy he's doing this thing there but no one's really got cancelled no one's career has completely been stopped and been they've been told look you're not gonna make money in the scene again because you made one mistake it doesn't really work that way so I was surprised that um, said people try to go out Nina Kravitz because if anyone has survived every kind of peak and value of a cancel culture has been in the Kravitz, sir. Right? From the whole bar thing to her just being an attractive woman. She's always been kind of consistently getting, you know, bullets and arrows, daggers are thrown at her. She's always kind of really um I think all things considered, she's kind of read it out really well. She's kind of responded kind of very measured or kind of ignored things and she's kind of let it all kind of, you know, uh, wash off her back really. Kind of wash off that's back really not really seem that bothered about it. But this one I don't really get in that regard, right? So, this article is the following from Resident Advisor. Nina Kravitz faced accusation of racism over appropriating cornrows and insensitive comments on Twitter, which is nuts, right? So, if you look at the title, essentially, she wore cornrows for an event or something or to promote a pro, uh, an EP. I don't know, whatever. It's a hairstyle. And essentially, she got criticized for doing the hairstyle. So, you're not allowed to have cornrows if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're not black. And also, she got persecuted or you know told off or uh piled on upon social media because of her comments on twitter because she didn't take it seriously because she had like a, a bit of a dry tone it's like come on man why would you take something like this seriously i wouldn't if i was nina kravitz but let's look let's read it and kind of make an opinion of it at the bottom so here's the following it's it's interesting as well though because you look at you look at her how she's wearing a chrome rose you see loads of MMA fighters with the same thing, right? When they're fighting, because obviously they don't want their hair to get pulled or to get caught up in stuff. So every MMA fighter gets their hair braided. I don't see it. I don't hear anyone else saying that that's cultural appropriation, right? What? Because if they did, I, I bet you any money, if, if people did say something about it being cultural appropriation, the, the mixed martial arts governing body, whatever it may be, or UFC would definitely buckle and get girls to start wearing fucking uh, scullies and shit instead to kind of keep their hair down. I bet you they would do that, which is absolutely nuts. Anyway, let's continue. So, the, Rus the Russian producer's refusal to back down amidst criticism over the photo of her hairstyle led to accusations and counter accusations of racism, which is absolutely nuts. Imagine being accused of racism because you don't want to say sorry for having her came rolls. It's like, it's just absolutely bizarre. Nina Kravitz is facing backlash for comments Sam now deleted she made on social media. The Russian producer posted selfies of her hair braided in cornrows on Twitter and Instagram early on Saturday morning, October 26th. Look at, look at Resident Advisor being fucking messy and, you know, saying the time and the date and the fucking when she put the cornrows. Who cares, man? Bloody hell. Kravitz was quickly, quickly called out for cultural appropriation as the style is deeply connected to black hair and history. And she replied, I can wear whatever I want. Thank you. Which is very true. I definitely agree with that. Uh... <laughs> and this here's a kind of a screenshot of her with the cane rolls and somebody tweeted on the comments i think just as a joke no nina we white people can't wear corn rolls culture preparation and she said i can wear whatever i want nina kravitz uh nos vemos in space ibifa uh what does it say here uh see you in space at miami at start at 7 a.m right and she's in miami hot place maybe you want to give your hair a bit of rest get it in braids i don't know whatever just you just want to have your hair in braids fuck it i don't care um uh, the label head responded to criticism in another deleted tweet saying, I'm not white European. Braids are part of my culture. Kravitz comes from an uh, Irkutsk city of Serbia, north of Mongolia. She then posted a screenshot from her Quara entry, which claims that nobody owns braids because it was connected to Vikings, Romans, Eskimos, and other cultures. That, and that should be the end of it, right? So if you're, if you're picking up a, a Quora article that says the, that, that kind of basically... Um, confirms our suspicions and tells you that no one owns cornrows and why the fuck are people making a big deal out of it and here's a sense here's the so-called quora article right which again you can't take all these things seriously and some people might you know make up the comments and stuff but for the most part quora is pretty well regarded the people that do respond on there are very fine for the most part they're academics who kind of have a little bit more knowledge on the said subject and aren't just people on twitter you know uh knee-jerk reacting to things because they don't have nothing else better to do so this is the uh, the query on quora it says the following is braiding hair 
uh, culture appropriation. And this is Michael Jacobs, who is a BA in psychology and an MA in anthropology, a lifelong student of human foibles. So I'm going to take this guy's opinion more so than some random person on Twitter, right? Some white dude with grey hair who seems like he reads a lot of books. Cool. He says the following. I can't imagine how it could be. The technique of braiding hair is found in multiple cultures worldwide. The Vikings, other Europeans did it too, and Eskimos too. Native Americans did it. Asian Romans and Greeks and Middle Easterns did it. Chinese, Japanese, Korean people did it. Sailors and the British Navy did it. And of course, Africans did it too, in a wide variety of styles. Nobody owns braiding. Um, the only way in which I could see a particular form of hair braiding as culture preparation is if some specific styles have some special meaning to a particular culture. Whereas, let me say, I don't know, if you see a, a white dude with fucking dreadlocks, for the most part, people kind of look down upon them. You know, because it comes from a, a mostly of a Rastafarian religion background, which is mostly associated with the Caribbean culture. Cool, but for the most part, braiding your hair down just seems like a a, a convenient approach to kind of managing your long hair in some regards. Especially if you're a Viking, right? I can't imagine fighting um, in Viking in Viking times like they do in a show Vikings with your hair flowing in the fucking wind and shit is probably practical. It probably might be beneficial to maybe have a headband on, maybe braid your hair in some way, shape or form, or maybe to make you more, look more menacing or to maybe slim it down the profile of your head so you can fit your helmet on it. Whatever. It's just a convenient approach to do it. Or maybe or maybe there's some something tied intrinsic to your tribe, right? You get your braid, head braided in a certain pattern, and whatever it may be. But to say it's owned by a particular culture is nuts. It's hair. Like what? So why people can't get fades? Like why wouldn't they? Uh, so the following so uh, the, uh, so um, the only thing I can find the only one which I can find particular form of hair braiding as culture preparation is if it's some specific style has some special meaning to a particular culture and it had been adopted by non-members of that culture in a disregard of special uh, or taboo or restricted or holy meaning that had applied um, I know some people try to argue that dreadlocks fit that description but they too existed for thousands of years in a variety of cultures long before Rastafarian culture made it one of their signature symbols. Okay, cool. So again, Rastafarian culture co-opted this hairstyle right into their kind of religion or their kind of culture right, which is mainly associated with Jamaica and some parts of the Caribbean but existed prior to Rastafarian. So again, not where, we don't own it, right? Is it a bit corny to see somebody wearing braids or see someone wearing cornrows that isn't black or white, that isn't black or mixed race or whatever it may be? Yes, in some regard. Right? When you see those, we see the little girls on the beach get her, their hair braided and putting beads when they're on the beach and shit. It can look a bit, it can look, it can look a bit silly. But so what? The girl's nine years old. She's on holiday. Let her braid her hair and have some fun, right? Just relax. Um, and, and to end it, it says, if you have a particular braiding style in mind, perhaps a quick look up of the history of the style as a cultural feature, and also in terms of its aesthetic, might be a good idea if you, if you desire to avoid disrespecting other cultures' icons. And again, why would you do all that stuff just because of a hairstyle? Like, go and fuck yourself. Honestly, it's not that serious. But let's go back to the article. So, people are basically mad more at Nina Kaz because she just didn't want to say sorry. So here's a so it says the following. Um, she also um, um, following on the for the article. Um, so she then posted a screenshot from Quora, which I kind of read out to you just now, uh, which claims that nobody owns the hair of hair braiding because it was also connected to Vikings, Romans, Eskimos, other cultures. But it does not account for the current reality that Black people are often discriminated against because of their hair. So what? So again. So the, they keep moving the goalposts. So they're saying that you can't have braids, right? Because it's a it's a, a specific thing only um, limited to black people. I don't agree with that. It's fucking bizarre. Get the fuck out of here. Cool. That argument's been completely debunked because we now have got a historical reference from a, his, his, from a historian, an anthropologist, right? Someone that is studying all these old societies and he's basically told us, no, cultures all around the world have their form of braiding. Braiding isn't specific to a particular region or a particular race of people. Fine. Then they move the goalposts and say, oh, okay, well, then it's because black people, if they wear braids, they're seen as thugs and, and bandits or gangsters, but white people aren't. We can't do nothing about that, unfortunately. It's sad, but we can't do nothing about it. I'm pretty sure it's the same thing with uh, kids that wear fucking low bats, right? And the trousers hanging off their bum. For the most part, if you see a white kid wearing that, you're not going to be as threatened as maybe seeing a black kid wearing that. It's just what it is. What can you do? Is it, am I asking a black kid to change so in order to fit in with the white world? No, unless he wants to live in that white world. I'm asking a white guy to kind of change in order to kind of not offend the black people. No, do what you want to do. Unfortunately, different people have different. Um, what you call? What? How do you call it? We're not even different. We will have to deal with different burdens in our lives. We, it, the life can't just be fair and even playing for. That isn't going to exist. We will have different burdens, whether it's from our history of our family, whether it's personality traits, whether it's quirks, whether it's interests, 
whether it's um, friends that we hang around with, whether it's our occupation. We all have our burdens we have to bear, and we have to make the most out of it. We have to make the best out of it as we can in the short time we have on have on Earth. To waste time debating and arguing over these minute details, and to making sure people will recognize the different inadequacies and different injustices or different areas. So before they do this, it's just it just wastes so much time, so much valuable time that actually could be uh, put more towards maybe educating everyone in general about stuff like this hairstyles where it comes around from all over the world and then so people have a better understanding of why they're doing that particular thing right that might be cool but to seek permission from a particular culture oh by the way you what you're gonna walk up to a fucking black random black guy or, or woman in the street and say hey by the way is it okay if i get my hair braided do you give me permission and they write a note for you and then you can carry that in your pocket and show people around hey um this woman uh gave me permission to do like no wouldn't it be better if we just all acknowledge that we all have a shared culture, a shared history, right? And so that, so that when someone says, oh, wow, I love your hairstyle, you can then suddenly say something like, yeah, by the way, this this started there. I got it from here. This inspiration. I just see that braid up pattern. You have, something to, you have some weight in it. Similar to like when you see a random kid wearing a uh, an Iron Maiden t-shirt, but they can't name five Iron Maiden songs. It just kind of breaks your heart a little bit. Like, come on, man. If you're going to wear the shirt, at least try and learn about the band. Same thing with the braids. Just try and learn about the history. But are we going to seek promotion? permission I swear, is that what we ask you? is that the fight i'm trying to ask for as a black dude no we have more we have bigger bigger things to kind of fight honestly like this is the lowest common denominator and a fight that doesn't make any sense too she's a dj right how can she be like by honestly by proxy how can you be racist as a dj it's gonna be really difficult to be a, a fervent racist right where are you gonna go to go dj what fucking italy every year like <laughs> not, not again you know it's a joke obviously but where are you gonna go you're a DJ. It's really hard to do that. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, anyway, so the following. Um, so that's weird, right? And then here's a quote um, from somebody called Extinct Damon. Extinct Damon. I don't know who this is. Probably a producer of some sort, I'm, I'm assuming, right? Um, this person was really angry and said, black people literally get denied jobs or harassed by the law enforcement for wearing their hair in brazen locks. I don't know what, what, what we can do about that at the moment, right? What do we do? Educate the people that are wearing braids and locks so they don't be antagonistic towards police. Educate police officers not to profile people that have braids and locks. Um, get people to cut off their braids and locks. I don't know. What is the, what is their solution there? This isn't the solution. But the solution lies in some of those questions that no one really wants to ask or to really answer. Figure out why... I don't know, figure out why exactly people with brazen locks are more suitable to getting pulled out. Figure why the police are more, the, I'm sure there's statistics that prove the police are more uh, more willing or more prone to arresting or to convicting people that have brazen locks or live from the impoverished areas. Maybe looking at why those areas are impoverished. Like there's areas that are more of interest and have more of a activism slant or more opportunity to do activism as opposed to kind of going around and fucking pointing out every, every white person's got braids like really that's not where the issue is here um yao's arguments of uh defending nina kravis are weak and lack an almost um what's that an instrumentable understanding of context and nuance okay cool whatever <laughs> So to the following end, carries on. The photos also spurred discussion about the little, the title of Nina Kravitz 2011. Oh my god! This is this is disgusting, man. So she gets braids, right? And then they're trying to pull out a 2011, 2011 track that she made called Ghetto Kravitz. On Monday evening, October 28th, Kravitz quoted one of those critical tweets and added, This is racism and should not be tolerated. Plus, Polish Jews will be very surprised to discover that the word ghetto <laughs> exclusively belongs to African-American culture. She has since deleted that tweet too. Nina Kravitz has been a problem, but nobody wants to have that conversation yet. Somebody uh, tweeted here, having a title like Ghetto Kravitz and then having cornrows. The girl needs to get cancelled already. Why? I don't care. I, I don't care. I'm just saying what y'all are thinking. Tired of these white girls and techno scene. Disrespectful. I don't understand this at all. This is really... And again, maybe this is again... Um, this is again the um, the unintended consequences of raising a profile up of you know the Black Madonna, Nina Kravitz, Peggy Goo, Charlotte the Wit, Amelia the Men, Amelia Amelia Lens on one level, and then the girls like this woman and shit, you know, on another level, right? Um, they represent kind of the alt, kind of you know, um, more of the queer slant in the scene. Maybe I don't know, whatever it may be called. Like that's the unintended consequence of raising up those girls I mentioned. Because what happens is that they essentially look like, you know, they're essentially like the girl version of the all boys club, really, right? Um, they're predominantly all white um, or look or white looking, Caucasian looking, and, and predominantly come from a certain kind of background, whatever it may be called. Cool, right? 
Um, maybe except for Nina Kravitz and Brett Madonna, they've all kind of been in the scene for maybe 10 years, maybe tops, but they've completely blown up, right, over the last couple of years. And the unintended consequence of it is that there are loads of girls on the scene who come from, um, you know, marginalized communities or un unrepresented communities within the electronic music space, whether it's to be people of color or, you know, whatever, whatever you term those group of people who are not white, who probably look at those girls and think, what the fuck, right? I play as good or as better as those girls. Um, maybe you're not as pretty as them or you're not as, um, what do you call it, social media. You, you don't have that social media tendency as those girls and you don't get given the same opportunities. So that's the unintended consequences of raising up those groups of girls and not looking at the other bits and bobs of it. And that's what happens. That's the danger of um, pointing at people based on what's in between their legs and then give them a platform. What should be happening in electronic music is that we should be having a uh, equal representation all across the board, not just because of women or men or because of people's uh, sexual orientation or the color of their skin, but in terms of everyone in general. It should be reflected within a DJ line. Sometimes you go to festivals and shit and you're like, fucking hell, man. These guys have no, there's absolutely no um, um, research, no discovery of new artists the same old people get booked again and again and again at festivals this is not even coming from like a, a selfish dj point of view just from like a punter you try to see something more interesting like show me something new and they don't do it instead they kind of do these draconian things like field day we're gonna have 50 percent women on the lineup it's like that's not what you want you want equal representation because what ends up having 50 percent women is that naturally if you're a big festival like field day you're just gonna end up booking the highest selling women anyway right the, the ones that actually bring the most amount of people to the festival the ones that sell the most tickets the one with the most social media following and then again, that, that that is just copying the old boys club and then making sure it's women. It just does it's so interesting to see how this stuff is evolving. Um But the girl the girl Kravitz stuff is just insane. I have no idea where this person's coming from. As if like a two thousand eleven track a two thousand eleven track has anything to do with what's happening what's actually happening now with the uh, Nina Kravitz and her cornrows. It's just absolutely disgusting to be honest in that regard, in my opinion, personally. Um I've not actually heard this track actually. Let, let me see, let me hear what this track actually sounds like. <laughs> I'm not really familiar with too many of Nina Kravitz's productions. Let me hear what this actually sounds like. Get a Kravitz. It's probably pretty good, isn't it? Is that oh, she's got a vi music video for it too, actually. But Nina's an OG as well, man. And all the girls that should be getting pillared in the scene, this is not the person you should be going after. Like, I don't get it. I just don't get it. Let's hear. Let's hear. Let's hear. Let's hear, let's hear, let's hear, let's hear, let's hear this song. So many of these. It's a guy wearing a joker mask, so it's not. So. Oh, yeah, I've heard this before. Yeah, this is really good. Man. And it's got people. And again, look, right? So people are claiming so she's get she's kind of. Um, what's, what's that word called? She's um, culture appropriating. But this video of Ghetto Kravitz has a black girl in it, um, has a white dude in it, breakdancing, right? Again, a respect for the culture that it's probably coming from with the, you know, the sample it's got from. There's kind of like, you know, a hip hop influence there, maybe a, a Chicago influence there, right? Maybe a Duke influence there. Um, some, you know, again, respect for the culture. Um, you've got a white person there that obviously respects the tenants of hip hop and is kind of, you know, in the whole breakdancing scene, a black girl with a massive afro doing some cool stuff in a nightclub. It's a pretty respectful video, it looks like. So good. She's amazing. I don't know what people are trying to cancel her for. That's not a person I want to cancel in that regard. But again, I don't want to cancel anyone. It's just a ridiculous statement in general. But let's go back to the article here. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Let's go back here. Let's go over here, it, right? So what happened in the end? She didn't. She, I, don't, I don't think she delete. She did. She deleted the tweets, but she didn't apologize for the video, which I'm happy for. It was for the braids, and it continued. Kravis um, cited a story that describes that the ghetto um, Nazis forced the ghettos Nazis forced Jewish people into during World War II as a defense for the ghetto Nazi. It was then pointed out that it was unlikely her techno music was inspired by these cultures and not Black America, where the genre originated. Or, or originated. If you talk to a person today and ask which culture does the term ghetto mostly apply, they'll probably say Black culture. Right? This person said historically. Yes, it was an Italian word for where Jews were forced, like like Venice, like Venice. Um, also in World War Two, Venice. Sorry, are you kidding me? Did you read history at all? Second World War, Jews living in ghettos all over Europe, uh, the streets. So it's a uh, people pointing out again. Nina Kravitz then called criticism, describing her as white woman racist. She exchanged tweets with this woman founder Frankie, or oh, she's not she's not to be messed about with the Kaiser Hutchinson, in which Kravitz accused. Um, 
Hutchinson of sharing terribly racist and bullying tweets of her on time of, on her timeline. Hutchinson replied, "If you want to pretend that's bullying instead of critique, go ahead. If you think if 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 I think you need to take your own advice, Nina, take a moment and listen." So she says the following: Frankie is going at her from can't believe you're actually going to the extent of co-opting experience racism as way of defending. A discussion of white privilege as a black person who had been supporter of your this is sad luckily for you your yes fans will make you think this is okay you think that spreading hate aggression separation bullying in our scene and validating reverse racism is okay i don't think that's okay that's not the values that our scene is built upon she's the following bs there are tons of other terry racist tweets all over your bullying tweets frank which is quite true she, she's not bullying but she's a little bit spicy on the whole social media defender this woman um Please just take a moment and realize what you are uh, signing into. Frank says the following: I don't know what person, and even I don't know that person. Even if I did, I have no shame in anyone from this woman calling out white privilege. That's what we stand for. If you want to pretend that bullying instead of um, critique, go ahead. I think you need to take your advice and uh, listen. In reply, Hutchinson tweet: Clavis accused this woman founder of being an actual racist. Insisted he tweet. She continued: I come from a remote Asian city, and all my life I have very little to do with talking. I had, very, I had very little to do with what you're talking about. You have no right to speak to me this way. Hutchinson said, "You're in over your head. Please read a book." <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! Don't surprise. Axel Mahmed Max said, called out hypocrisy and Kravitz explaining the Tesco the techno scene values to Hutchinson. I've done enough to us for our scene and have gone through a lot of bullshit to bullying to be where I am. Kravitz responded, "You're being extremely arrogant right now." Listen, I've done enough, which I agree with. Soon after, Kravitz the leader tweets, "Give a response. It's going crazy. Out of proportion. I'm not a racist." But yeah, she never. She did. She did not. She did not apologize which i'm happy about right again i think in this case it's a haircut i think even if she's ignorant enough not to know the history of braids i think if you're someone like a frankie from this woman i think you just have to like i wouldn't say white privilege but white ignorance is allowed people are allowed to kind of just co-op to hairstyle or even co-op just you know copy a black hairstyle if they want to a, 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 black, a hairstyle that's more ascribed to black people and just do it because they just feel like it looks cool um, I'd much rather that than her cower and apologize, and then and then what? She hasn't really learned the lesson. If she does that. If you know, if you're Frankie and she apologizes, you know you don't believe her anyway. So I'd much rather they have this dialogue. People are able to see where Frankie stands and able to see where Nina Kravitz stands, and it's up to you, the fan of the electronic music scene. It's up to you, the fan of both these women, to decide which side of the fence you fall on. Or if you're like me and you just love both parties, you love this woman, you love what Frankie's done with this woman, and you also love Nina Kravitz and what she's done, you don't care. You sit in the middle. You acknowledge the, the spat they're having because there's two women arguing and, you know, as a dude, to get involved in that is really weird. But you just let them have the spat, let them air it out in public, and that's it. But no one gets cancelled. No one starts sending fucking screenshots to her agent or to the clubs that she Nina Kravitz is playing at so she gets her gigs cancelled. No one does all that kind of nonsense stuff. Have a, have, have a disagreement of a point of view of, of how you see the world. Fair. But don't try and get people cancelled. Don't try and ruin their livelihood. Don't try and get them kicked out of the scene. Don't try and uh, besmirch their credibility or reputation. Maybe point out the deficiencies in their thinking. Cool. But it's then it's up to us as consumers to decide. Because if consumers cancel you, that's okay. If consumers decide, you know what? I don't res I don't like your point of view. I'm not going to buy into what you do. I'm going to kind of stay away from you. Totally. Cool. But panelists should not be going out and sending screenshots to booking agents and to clubs and festivals to get people cancelled. That is not on. I just don't like it. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. Look what happened to fucking um, Jackmaster. Right? The scene they effectively booted him out in a nice way. Right? They said, look, that's not cool. Especially when the whole details of the issue came out. He went away and like a grown-up took a full accountability for it. Did some self-work. Um, it seems like he's repaired himself and he's maybe got a bit sober and he's a bit more clear-headed. He's moved away, like, for the for most part. I haven't seen him in London in ages. I haven't seen him play here in ages. Um, I think he played recently maybe at Fabric or something like that. But he's kept a really low profile and he's done the necessary work needed to kind of reintegrate himself back into the scene. And everyone that I've seen him pictured around are people that I think would hold him up to that, right? Or would kind of make sure they call him out on his shit. People like Steph Trucks and all the other, other dudes. I don't think they would just stand by and let him kind of, you know, carry on doing what he did before. So the fact that he's standing next to these people, I have to assume... They've had those hard conversations and he's shown them within his actions and whatever he's done that he's a changed person. And over time, us as punters can also decide whether or not we want to accept him back again when he does his next headline show at Printworks, right? That is where we decide. But we shouldn't be going out and cancelling them like that and just sending out tweets. No, no, no. You decide with your feet and your money. But you don't go out and, and cancel them by going to the event bookers and managers and, the, and festival organisers. That's not on. I don't think that's cool. It's so weird. And I never got that thing. 
If you don't like what someone says, just don't listen to what they say. Like I despise Carl Cox after he he blamed the London riots in the early in kind of you know the two thousand uh, London riots. Remember during the Resident Advisor Exchange, you tried to ask him about the London riots. He he started mentioning um, it has something to do with the kids listening to too much R and B and hip hop. Like fuck off, you know what I mean? That's why I knew it was a, a complete bounty. But again. I just don't support him by not going to his things. I don't watch his videos. We just let him be let him be who he is. But I'm not gonna clip that clip that little clip from his friends of Andrew Exchange and send it to people and say, Oh, look at how dumb he is. He's ignorant, he doesn't get black culture. No, just let him live his life. It doesn't it doesn't align with my values and the way I see stuff. Cool. But I'm not gonna go and ruin his whole life in order to kind of make my life feel better. That's ridiculous. But again, what a weird what a weird topic, isn't it? What a weird topic. Lena Kravitz can't get braids, like Okay, that's the fight you want to fight, yeah? The braids thing. Cool, anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Da, 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 da. Trezor Finder opens up a new club. That's better news, actually. That's more fun. More fun, more fun, more fun. So, um, the founder of Trezor, uh, D- Dimitri Higman, who I've actually heard him speak a few times um, on different podcasts, is opening up another club, right? So he's always very, um, I think, I don't know what it is about this dude. Maybe it's the interior designers he works with, but he's always creating some really cool, interesting spaces. Um, so this is a basement bar he's opening up um, in northwest of Germany. Um, let me get up here on the screen. Uh, Resident Advisor article, Trezor's DB Germany to open up a new club in northwest of Germany, um, which is interesting too, because it's not opening up in Berlin, it's opening up somewhere else. So maybe trying to expand the techno sound and scene across the entire um, a span of Germany and not just in the in the main city, which probably is a thing that he's doing. I don't know, but it looks really cool and interesting. The um, as yet unnamed basement space in the region of Westphalia, where Higman was born. Uh, Trezor Founder is doing his club. Look at look how cool that looks, man! It's amazing, isn't it? Basement club with the cool lights on it. Basement clubs are always better than actual clubs that are on street level, no? It's something about descending down into the stairs. I remember that's what that was. That was the thing about Plastic Peoples that I fucking loved, man. You remember Plastic Peoples? Plastic Peoples was one of the best London clubs we ever had. And again, like region, that's because I think Plastic People is probably one of the clubs, if not the only club in London, that I think really suffered from regeneration and the kind of. Uh, gentrification of London that was the one that really was the one that they fucked up on they should have never closed that one like Curtain Road middle of Shoreditch basement bar cool nights like just one of the best venues ever out like had some legendary parties at that place man um so yeah it was on Curtain Road in Shoreditch which if you're familiar with Shoreditch is like basically the main area main strip now um great sound system 250 people capacity if not a bit smaller than that as you can see from these pictures it's fucking tiny like absolutely dirty sound system um, great um, events on there. Just a really, really cool space. Wow, man. Oh, the, sorry, that's Peckham. That's Cavendish Pool Club in Peckham. Sorry, I was about to say. So many legendary nights I've had in Plastic People, man. I re- I, that's the one place I think I really, really... Uh, I'm sad that was, you know, didn't hang around longer. Rotary Mixer. Uh, nice turntables. The booth where you can see the DJ and slap on the fucking roof and shit. which is such a good venue, man. Again, really, really a bummer this place had to close when it did. But yeah, Plaza People was definitely the one. Oh, I'd see my friend there as well on the front. Cool. But yeah, so um, DB Checkman opened up his own club, Basement Club, which again, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of. The Berlin-based visionary um, who was born in... Uh, well, Westphalia in nineteen in nineteen fifty four and wrote the news via Facebook, calling the project a dream come true. It's sick. Uh, though the venue doesn't have a name yet, Higman Pinder promises an excellent sound system and effective acoustic treatment in a raw basement. Of the programming, he says the club will bring international DJs to the rural area as well as supporting fresh local talent. The opening date is still to be 2VC. Read him as original post here. Take a sneak peek inside. Really cool, man. So here's his post. I was born in a little village in Westphalia. And since many years, I wanted to run a club uh, with a small and excellent sound system and effective acoustics. That's what I've wanted too. That's a big dream of mine. Imagine opening a nice little basement club, 300 people capacity, and booking your friends, having some international DJs fly by here and there, and also having a space that people can just come to and don't care about who does on the lineup, right? That's that's the main thing you want. I'm not sure how hard or how easy that is to do that sort of thing, but that's something I'd love to do. Um, somewhere in a raw basement. <laughs> I found an old empty space, an opportunity. We an, a, a, an opportunity. We fixed it, and now the venue is nearly ready to go. Trezor Berlin will support this plan with a solid artist program. No name yet, but a lot of confidence. I'll tell you that that nice little humble space go, got sold. I believe this club will direct a focus of international techno artists on the city. 
in the rural areas and serves the local artists as a springboard to expand their own DJ careers. A dream come true soon. That's awesome as well. Imagine the careers you're going to be able to be birthed from that little space. It looks fucking incredible. Basement club. I'm not sure if that's made out of wood, the DJ booth. That looks cool. Some couches at the back here. Some really cool lights that look like similar to the lights that you might see in a studio of a TV show or some shit. There's a little cool alleyway here with bricks on either side. Um, yeah, really just cool space overall. It looks fucking interesting. Exposed brick, of course, because why Why not if you've got a German club? A basement German club has to have exposed brick. I don't want to see no stupid plastering on the side of the walls or anything. It just looks fucking incredible. I'm a big fan of it. Uh, it's such big up Dimitri. It was fucking cool. Wow. So yeah, un yeah unnamed space. So check that out or keep an eye out for that when that gets named. Um, and again, it's going to be another opportunity. This is what I like about club culture, though, because it gives me the opportunity to go to places I would never go to. I don't think I would ever have been to Frankfurt if I didn't go to Robert Johnson, right? If I wasn't infatuated with Robert Johnson. I'm probably not going to. The probably reason why I'm going to go back to Munich, it's not Munich, um, Dort Dortmund, is for Club Division not Club Division Air, um, Salon, de Salon de Amateurs, right? All these different places around the world that have a burgeoning kind of club scene or coming up or get featured in different places like Resident Advisor or Mix Mag or, you know, you hear about on different forums, then get you interested and you start doing the whole club tourism thing. You end up you end up visiting places you never think you'd visit. That's the thing I love about electronic music. Like, the, again, nightlife. And then, you, again, you meet you go to these places, you meet some cool people, you build some contacts, and then who knows? Who knows what happens? I love it. I fucking love it, man. Big up, uh, Dimitri. Top dude, top, top, top man, top man, top man, top man. Uh, what else we got here on the list we want to talk about before we head out? Because already an hour has passed, hasn't it? Ba -ba -ba. We got, um, yeah, let's end it there, actually. Let's end it there. I think that might be a way to end it. End it there for now. One hour in. Uh, as always, thank you so much for tuning in. This is Excellent Zinger Show, episode number 243. If you want more info regarding myself, visit my website, excellentzinger.com. Be in the show notes. You see all my um, links on my social media platforms. Like I mentioned before, I've got a new mix out. It's a test mix of episode number 31, EBM special, electronic body music. If you're interested to hear what that genre sounds like, please click the link in the show notes and descriptions. Give the mix a listen. Share it with your friends. Um, and get, give me some feedback if you um, like it or not. That would be cool. Um, any comments regarding the show, leave them in the, sh in the comments on YouTube or email me in the link again. You'll be able to find my website, excellentzinger.com. I'm DJing this Saturday, um, the 2nd of November at Heathcote and Star for my night called Labatees. Um, so you can find that again in the show notes, all the links on my DJ gigs uh, listings on my website. And if you're listening via the YouTube, um, then please give me a thumbs up. Click subscribe if you want to see some more videos from me. And if you're listening via the podcast app, why not leave me a five-star review and share the episode with your friends. But until then, see you guys again very, very soon. Take care and peace. <laughs>